Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lady Steel Podcast. Guess what, y'all? I messed up. See, remember before, actually, you know, you wouldn't remember because now you'd be listening to the Lady Steel Podcast. Oh, no, I lied. I lied. I lied. That's up number two. Going for it today. That's what I'm doing. So the podcast before this, the episode, if you were listening to it, I said, oh, I'm going to make this a Lady Steel Podcast because I don't have someone for the Lady Steel Podcast and we have four podcasts. So I made it a Lady Steel Podcast. And then right after them, the next interview was someone for the Lady Steel Podcast. <laughs> so uh double 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 your fun hey and don't sue me on that because there's nothing left to take unless you want some of my cotton candy and i just don't give that up i'm sorry someone came up and robbed me and they're like cotton candy or your life i'd be like well it was my last good bit of life <laughs> give me one more second before you stab me let me get it off my off my palm all right go ahead i'm good you can, you can kill me now Anyway, that's why my tongue is blue. And I said before I started this, I wasn't going to show my tongue. And ah, because <laughs> I'm currently eating cotton candy. I got up and drove 10 minutes to a store, waited for my cotton candy to get made, stuck in a bag, drove back, and eating cotton candy with no water now because I moved spots. So it's going to get a little hairy. Okay, it's sticky. It's going to get a little sticky. So I'm going to hurry up and uh, talk about what I do. Because I don't know. Oh, my God, I remember to introduce myself. Okay, go. I'm a professional person here. I should act like I was from bed. I'm not doing that. It was a lovely try, though. I tried, and I failed. I'll try again the next one. No, okay. I wrote books. Yes. Yes, I did. And they are, and I thought divorce was bad, and I thought being grown up was easy. If only our mere memoir and verse foreign coffee, widow's web, and widow's debt. If you're counting along with me, that is six, six audiobooks. And if you're wondering why I'm doing six like this, because that's a sign language six. All righty. You can get those audiobooks. Oh, my goodness. And he signs back, I understand. With a yes. Oh, we're going to have to do some sign language here today. I see that name. Oh. And then he ruined it with little bits. Okay. <laughs> Moving on with my interview. <laughs> with myself apparently at this moment um and, <laughs> and then if you've been watching us for a while you know that what comes next this is the sign language part so there were six books and now we're going to add 11 more books and that equals 17 books total and you can find the rest of oh i'm sorry 17 more books which makes it 23 because i forgot that we wrote two more books this year <laughs> so um you can find the rest of those at www.endithoughtladies.com and I've spent too much time talking about me to do it as a car salesman. Oh, screw it. I lied. One more time as a car salesman for my website, www.endithoughtlady.com. Yeah. You feel like you should go down, go down to like the street and like buy a website or something now, right? Car salesman style. Anyway, you're not here to hear about me, which feels weird to say. Because I've been talking the whole time. You're here to hear about my wonderful guests. Wonderful guests, would you like to introduce yourself? I'd be happy to, Well, known. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Paul Zeidman. I'm a screenwriter based out of San Francisco. And I was instructed uh, when we started this thing to tell you three things about me. OK, well, I've already told you my name. I told you what I do, where I live. Uh, I can tell you a few other things. Uh, I've got this many books to my name uh they're all pretty much the same title there it's, it's called go ahead and ask uh, uh books about screenwriting and pie because those are two very important things to me uh and those are assorted interviews that i've done over the years so i run this blog called maximum z which is about screenwriting primarily it's about me trying to make it in as a screenwriter and i started it in 2009 and it's still going now uh, every i post once a week and over the years, I've done over 100 interviews with script consultants and movie makers and writers in all kinds of mediums like comics and plays and short films. And I just have all had this uh, big collection of interviews. And I thought, I want to put these out as books. So I did. So I have three books, volumes one, two, and three, and they're all available on Amazon. There's my plug for that. Uh, another thing about me, uh, part of the reason that the book involves the word pie is because I love to cook. I love to bake. Uh, if you ask me like what my favorite thing to make is, anything that makes my family happy. And fortunately for me, there's a lot. Like just last night, uh, I made pasta. 
because I love homemade pasta. I don't think I'm ever going to buy it again from the store. Uh, and we had a, uh, a vegan pesto sauce because my wife can't really do the oil thing as much. And so that was really yummy. And roasted Brussels sprouts. And that was, yeah, I can see you rolling your eyes because it sounds delicious. And it was. Uh, third thing. Wow. Um, trying to think. I live in California. I love it. I was born and raised in the uh, wilds of southern New Jersey, but decided to uh, had to get out. And so I'm on the other side of the country now. And no regrets. Love it here. Um, the, the ocean is, from my perspective, the ocean is about a mile that way. So straight ahead. And uh, I consider myself very fortunate to live here. And uh, I think that's three plus things about me. So uh, we'll know and feel free to, you know, fire away with any other questions you have. I could talk about cotton candy as well. My wife grew up in Western Pennsylvania and uh, a stone's throw from an amusement park there. In Kennywood. The Pittsburgh. Kennywood, exactly. She lived just to like really like half a mile away. And one of her earliest jobs was making cotton candy there. And so she knew how to do the thing there. And, I was, and you know, every time we'd go there when I was visiting or after we got married and go back to visit her family, we'd go to Kennywood and she would say, oh, yep, there's the potato patch and there and there's, you know, the where they did the cotton candy. And here's that roller coaster, the thunderbolt and the jackrabbit and the racer. And not too far away from the uh, the the water rabbits. Uh, well, there's Sandcastle, no, which is the is water that, park. Oh, there is. Yeah, track. there is a water ride there. I think it's called yeah. it's rapids or something like mm -hmm. that. But I know what the potato jack is. OK, OK. We didn't do that one as much, but uh, we did all the other stuff. So it's how I found the potato shack. OK, cotton candy. Cotton mm -hmm. candy rides, and I've had cotton candy across this nation. Wow. Kingdom has the most amount of cotton candy in an amusement park and a bag that's freshly done for a cheaper price than I have ever had. And my wife, uh, you know, she spent part of her teen years making that cotton candy for people I'm like you to enjoy. I'm tempted to pay for y'all to come over so you can make it in my cotton candy machine. Oh, she would know. She still knows how to do it, too. Yeah, yeah she and there is a we're really lucky here that there's like a it's kind of. They do it like uh, April through October. Every Friday night, they have this thing called Off the Grid, which is this like huge assortment of food trucks, like 20 to 30 food trucks. And when my daughter was little, we went to one of them and she got this thing of cotton candy was probably like that big. So like about two and a half feet wide. And you just have this picture of her just holding it like, you know, like she won Miss America and there's this giant bouquet in her arms, but it's cotton candy and it's it's it was like white, but it had flavors to it. And that's that one of that's one of the things I remember about cotton candy, this is at least the most recent one anyway. I had three weeks ago, I had one of those, a large one, because the lady next next to me at a, at a I, we also do some other short type of events. The lady next to us, I was like, maybe the biggest cotton candy you could ever make. And I'm standing there literally like. <laughs> like I just got the crown on my head. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, and candy! Like, yeah. Okay. Anyway, we're here to talk about cotton candy. We're here to talk about pie now. We can do that. <laughs> because hey, if you're not talking about one sweet, you should talk about another. It's true. I mean, we are the leading country for diabetes. Let's let's go ahead and oh. continue the trend. Let's continue the trend. Yes, let's. Oh, and then number three, I have to talk about pasta. And then I swear we're going to talk about, you know, what you're at. We could talk about writing stuff, but I'm more than happy to talk about food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll get to the writing. We will. I okay. Swear. It'll be like the last question. No, I'm <laughs> so, um, hi, what is your favorite pie? Please don't say rhubarb. And how do you, how do you make your crust like wonderful? Okay, so okay, so I would say I have two favorites. It's a, It's a split down the middle between pecan and pumpkin. And I and I love to, like I said, I love to bake. So I love to make pies. And I've I kind of make it an effort. Like whenever I go out and there's pecan pie on the menu, and if I'm not stuffed from the rest of the meal, I will get a piece and kind of gauge it. I will compare it to my own. Uh, the I can't say I've had like phenomenal pecan pie. Uh, and I will say that probably the biggest compliment I ever got was I made it and we took it to a friend's house. And this woman was born and raised in Georgia. And so, she, but she lived in the Bay Area at the time. And so she had a piece and she said, speaking as a former, former Georgia peach, I have to say this is probably one of, if not the best pe pecan pie I've ever had. And so oh I, I took that, I took that so much to heart. And so I pride myself on my pecan. It's really good. And it took me a lot of, uh, experimentation to get it so it didn't get it wasn't all runny and goopy when you cut it even if you let it cool 
but I think I finally got it. So that that's one I love to make. Uh, and when I make pumpkin, um, you know, I make them primarily in the fall and the winter because when the local pumpkin patch goes on, they sell, you know, jack-o'-lantern pumpkins, but they also sell sugar pumpkins, which you can use to make, you know, pumpkin pie from scratch. And I've, I've started doing that and people are always amazed and impressed that when you can do that, because it's like, oh, well, you know, anybody can open a can, you know, get your can of Livy's at the store and, you know, whip it all together. But if you can take a pumpkin and roast it and mash it all up and mix it together, it, it's just got a certain special quality to it that it's it's kind of hard to beat. And regarding crust, I think I just have, wow, I think it, oh gosh, because I have a like a stack of recipes. It's like that, that big that I've accumulated over the years, not for pie, just for everything. And so one of them is like, I think it's like best ever pie crust. And it's pretty, pretty standard, pretty basic. I use it for all of them. But one of the things I've discovered, because my daughter loves the pumpkin pie, that I tried making it without a crust and it worked out really well. It's just it's because it's so solid that you can cut it and it comes out of the pan without falling apart, without leaving anything in the pan. And it's really and it's a little bit lighter because you don't have the crust, you know, much as you like the crust without the crust, it's actually just as good. It's exactly how I make my pumpkin pies. I make them once a year okay. and then stick them in the freezer after I make them. Uh, I make six pumpkin pies. Nice. And then I make mini pumpkin tartlets. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you got to roast the pumpkin seeds. Mm hmm. And then, of course, then after that, it becomes pumpkin muffins and pumpkin loaves of bread. Okay, so I will throw add one more in for you. So yes, about it, about a year and a half ago. So there's a lot of uh, uh, local coffee shops uh, around our neighborhood, and so we went to one. This was probably like uh, November, early December of I guess 2022, and they were selling uh, chocolate chip pumpkin scones. So probably about like the size of your fist, and they were five dollars. And I thought. Wow, that's 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 high for a scone, and it, but it was really good. And so you know, we get into like February of last year, and I thought because my wife really liked it, and I thought I'm going to try and make it myself. And so I found a recipe, and you know, had the pumpkin and the chocolate chips, and you know, whipped it all together, and it made eight scones. And because I get up super early for my regular job, and so I had time to. Uh, make scones while she was still asleep and so she woke up she said it smells so good and i and i surprised her with it and she's like oh my God. and so i've that that is i've made those a couple of times and i've even like made them to send to you know friends and family because they're you know popular and then they're just so darn tasty when's your etsy shop coming up <laughs> uh you know what i've i've sent uh baked goods through the mail like i said to friends and family and because, uh, as I mentioned way back in the beginning of this, that I'm also a screenwriter. And so I've offered to, because a lot of people will uh, pay to get script notes on their work. And I said, would you, be, would anybody be willing for a cookies for notes exchange program? And I had a couple of people actually take me up on it. So they read my script, gave me notes, and I sent them like three dozen cookies. Oh my goodness. Okay. So now, now we are getting, <laughs> I, I lied. One more detour, then we're getting right there. Sure, sure. So was this your first time making pasta? Because if it was, I really want to hear about like how it worked for you. I'm, I make pasta as well. Okay. Um, yeah, oh. it's a lot of work though. Well, like, it, it, and it, you it, said it, you're it, never it, buying it again. I was like, well, it, what it can, can be, you do? It can be a lot of work, but it's, I mean, it's pretty much. Uh, so uh, my holiday gift a couple of years ago was a KitchenAid mixer. Oh. And so got that and uh, had that and, and loved using it to make stuff. And then... Um, I saw on social media, like friends of ours, they had uh, pasta, I guess like a pasta maker, but I didn't want an actual pasta maker because we only have so much space. But apparently KitchenAid has uh, pasta making attachments for the mixer. So that was like my gift the, the next year. And so I decided I was going to try it and it comes with a recipe for pasta. And so I made that and this was in our previous place. So it was a much tighter space to work with, but uh, so I decided I wanted to make pasta just to get, see if I could do it. And also, uh, I'd never made pesto before. So, so I made, you know, fettuccine and, uh, po uh pesto and, nice. and just like, it was like all, it was all one big experiment. And, uh, the reaction from my wife and my daughter was just like, 
oh my God. <laughs> and it was just because there's something about, I think about fresh pasta, as you probably know, it's, 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 it's got a certain, it's so different from, you know, you know, you buy it at the store and, and boil it for 10 minutes type of stuff. And it's so much lighter and that there's, it's just a better quality. Uh, you know, I hate to, I hate to use this because I hear like it on a I, dish almost. Like, yeah, almost. And I hear this on Bake Off so much. It's got a different mouthfeel to it. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not funny. But it's true. I'm sorry. It is. It and is. not like that. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah. So, pretty much, um, I have made so many batches of fettuccine and the occasional spaghetti. Uh, I mean, do, I, do I want to make stuff like, you know, macaroni or bucatini or, you know, or any of that? I would love to, but we're lucky that there's a place. Uh, relatively close by that sells like they make fresh pasta every day so if we want something different we can they have like three dozen kinds of pasta available so it's it's phenomenal so i'm jealous mm. Terribly we're, jealous. This is a very food centric town and we're we're thrilled about it <laughs> yes. when you and he said at the beginning he loves living there there you go you that's have one of the reasons why he loves living there well, all right yes mm-hmm now, I was going to say, because I've talked about this with friends, like we're really spoiled uh, living here in the Bay Area because like I think it's we have more restaurants per capita than in any other city. And unfortunately, there's a lot of turnover. So like you can go to a restaurant and love it. But if you try to go three months later, they may have closed because they you know they just had to shut down because the rent was too high or whatever. But yeah, we're extremely lucky that, you know, we've got the, all the farms in the Central Valley and throughout the Bay Area. So all this amazing food, you know, produce and, and vegetables and all kinds of meats from local farms. It's just, it, you know, it, it, it is a food lover's uh, paradise around here. Oh, my goodness. So I've always said I wanted to visit San Francisco, but I wouldn't go because it's too expensive. I'm driving down from Bay, from Los Angeles next time. And I'll I'll be in LA in May, so um, yeah. It is only about a five to six hour drive north, so you're all set. Yeah, it's gonna be a long drive, but it's gonna be worth it. I'm gonna be sleeping in a parking lot somewhere, but it's gonna be worth it because we're driving back. Okay, we're getting to screenwriting. Yes, what please. We're supposed to be here for. Okay. I love how he said yes, please. <laughs> I think even he's tired of talking about food. I'm not tired of hearing about it. Oh my goodness! So. You have decided to become a screenwriter. How does one even begin on being like, this is what I'm going to do and get into the process of actually like getting your screenwriting closer to being a movie? Well, see, that's it. That's the thing is that it is screenwriting is such a unique animal in the world of writing. Like everybody writes a book and they think, oh, when yeah, I've written a book or or they, you know, they see a movie and they figure I, I like that. I want to learn how to do that. And there are certain rules and guidelines that you need to follow, but once you kind of become familiar with them and you learn how to do them, that you can kind of start bending the rules a little bit. So you don't have to have a cookie cutter script that, I mean, I'm one of those people I've, I've been a writer since I was little. I mean, for me, it was like I had a notebook and I just, you know, scribbled, you know, really crappy stories in it. And that, and I just really loved, you know, writing stories and creating, uh, concepts and characters and just things that one of the things I always I do this presentation on screenwriting and one of the things I tell writers is write something you would want to watch because the passion you have for your story should be evident on the page that you can tell the writer really cares and to put a lot of effort into it and the thing is with screenwriting is that it takes a long time to not just learn how to do it but to learn how to do it well and uh it's for me it was kind of like I started out, you know, that kind of writing. And then I, you know, started and I loved movies my whole life. And I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a try. And first, you know, it required, you know, you need special software for writing a screenplay. You can't just put it in Word and you can't just, you know, uh, you know, kind of wing it. That first I had to try it. This was, you know, like in the mid nineties, I had to try and there was, getting screenwriting software was an impossibility. And I finally managed to track it down because you had to get it like at a at the writer's store, which was in LA and they had one up here in Sausalito. But I mean, we're going into like regular software stores at the mall and say, hey, do you have any screenwriting software? And you, you get the 20 something clerk is like, what? <laughs> because they didn't know what it was. And so, you know, all of the scripts up until then, you know, they had people to type them out for you. But once these programs came out and the two are uh, final draft and movie magic, and there's some other ones, but I don't really, I'm not familiar with those that once you kind of learn the basics of how a script should look on the page, that's kind of where you, that's your launching pad. That's where you start. 
And you're going to make a lot of mistakes when you start out. I know I certainly did. And you, you, because when you're writing a screenplay, you're probably still thinking with the mindset of a book writer that you can write down what somebody is thinking or why somebody is doing that or what something really means when they're doing something. And you can't do that because the primary rule with screenwriting is show, don't tell. That if you see someone on the screen, like you see a guy at the sink washing dishes, you can't write, you know, you know, Bob stands at the sink washing dishes, but his mind goes back to that girl he took to the prom and dumped him and ran off and now lives with a plumber in Akron. You know what we're going to see on the screen? A guy washing dishes. So you have to figure out a way, how do you convey this kind of information in as visual a way as possible? And you don't want to have the characters just speaking things because that's boring and that's really not what cinema is all about. So it's all about learning how to present the information in a visual way, but to also make it interesting. You want us to, it starts with the reader. You want the reader to, you want to grab their attention and hold on to it for you know 90 to 120 pages. And that's not easy because a lot of writers kind of, uh, their writing can be a little drab. You have to learn how to punch it up. You have to learn to make it interesting that you can't say things that are exactly what the character means. There's there are these things called subtext and nuance. And you want to make it a fun read. I mean, it depends on the kind of story. If you're writing a horror, you want it to be scary. You want to, you want to keep the goosebumps on the uh, reader's skin. You want to you want to scare them you want but they what they're so scared but they want to know what happens next or if it's a drama or if it's a you know a silly cartoon you know is is that kind of a vibe coming off from what you're reading on the page so I love, go ahead i love what you said that you have to show and i think that that's such a huge point especially coming from an author's point of view because mm -hmm. we are used we are used to having a good seven eight pages you know what was going on around and thinking and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden that seven, eight pages is about, well, about four lines. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, see, that's but the thing. Everything is that... else around it has to be built. So those four lines, actually, you get the same feeling. Yeah. So they're like, uh, I took a seminar from, he's, he's since retired, Richard Walter, who was the head of screenwriting at UCLA. And he had this story that a writer had, was describing a garden party. And they were, but they were going into so much detail. And he was talking about like, you know, what the weather was like and what the people were wearing and what they were serving. And he said, and think of the page of a screenplay as real estate. And you want the more white space you have, the better. And his, his guideline, which I think is probably one of the best pieces of writing advice I've ever heard is write as if ink costs a thousand dollars an ounce. So you want to have say as much as you can with as few words as possible. And so he asked this writer, he said, well, why are you have, why do you have all this description? He said, because I want to, this is how this garden party is going on. He said, well, that this takes up like six lines and that's a lot of, that's a big chunk of text on the page. And that's kind of not the best way to do it. So what is the, what is the core message you're trying to convey? And he said, well, it's, it's a lavish garden party. So, okay, you know, exterior garden day, a lavish garden party takes place. See, you you hear that phrase, you th can visualize what it is in your imagination, and it's probably totally different from what I'm imagining, but it's it's the same uh, idea. It's a lavish garden party, and this is what's going on in this scene. And that's one line, or you know, with the slug line and the description line, that's two lines on the page. You just saved yourself like six lines of the script. And so a lot of writers especially in their earlier scripts, they tend to overwrite. They'll put too much information on the page and not realizing, like, I don't need to say that. And like, cause I've had, uh, I've seen scripts where the writer goes, has like almost a paragraph describing what the character looks like. And you don't need that because they'll, they'll talk about their appearance. Oh, it's, you know, she's 5'10 and she's buxom and she's blonde and she's got gorgeous blue eyes. It's like, well, what if they fire, hire an actress who has brown eyes? Is that going to mess things up? You, and just say, you know, you know, you know, she's drop dead gorgeous. You know, that's all you need because it's, it's all about trying to be as concise and to the point as possible, but also really conveying the message you're trying to get across. Exactly. I think um I was Again, I'm sorry. I talk about me a lot here. No. Okay. So I was really fortunate because when I really wanted to get my my screenplay, not even screenplay, TV screen thing done. Mm -hmm. At the time, my friends were directors and uh, but producers for line budgets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I started writing and they were like, money? 
And where is my font? If you write every description, what am I supposed to imagine? More white space means my job. You know, it's like, oh. So, character, 35-year-old man, dad bod. Black hair. Maybe. <laughs> they like, and they were like, mm, and the black hair goes. Okay. Yeah. Because that's a casting director's job. Right. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, you've got dad bod. That's all. It says everything I need to know. He's got his age. And, and always, you only need something specific about the appearance uh, if it's important to the character or to the story. Like if they have a scar, you know, maybe there's a story behind that. Because uh, one of the things I've seen in uh, so many scripts is, you know, you know, Bob, you know, 40, uh, ruggedly handsome. I was like, well, all all actors are handsome. So it uh, does it does it have to be ruggedly handsome? Is he, you know, I, I think I described a character in one of my scripts as like hipster lumberjack. And because that was different. And also it, it was two words. And I think it conveyed what I was trying to get across. Uh, but you don't need, uh, especially for female characters, you know, she's, you know, she's so gorgeous, or she's beautiful. And you know, are, are the are the dreaded uh, gorgeous, but doesn't know it. <laughs> no, trust me, she knows it. Oh, my God. So, okay. You have been in this game for a little bit, because uh, you went through and had to go to the writer's shop. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry you had to go to the writer's shop. Oh, well, no, well, that's that was the only place to get it was the only place to get the software. Yeah. I mean, you can easily get it now online. But, you know, I've been doing this for quite a while. I mean, I've had limited success. Uh, I've had a, you know, worked with a couple of producers on their projects and had a couple of shorts made. But I uh, I haven't gotten the golden ticket. I don't have something you can go to your multiplex and see or something that's streaming, but I'm working on it. And the part of, that's the thing is that a lot of writers get into screenwriting thinking, you know, I'm going to churn out a script. It'll only take me like two or three weeks and I'm going to sell it like that and quit my job and I can move to L.A. and buy a big ass house. But no, it doesn't work that way because it really about screenwriting. It's a marathon, not a sprint that nothing well, happens. Does... Nothing oh. happens overnight. And well, that's right. That way you're pissed off at the person that happened to. Well, that's the thing. I'm is not it, even it, in screenwriting. And no, like, because I, you <laughs> see, you see someone achieving success and it could and sometimes you see like, oh, it's their first script, but it's the first one they sold. It may not be the first one they wrote. They could have been, you know, struggling away, you know, burning the midnight oil uh, uh, when they're not working their day job for 10 years and then they sell a script and everyone's like, Oh, you know, so fine. Yeah. It worked for him. But why isn't it working for me? That the, a lot of writers, it's also easy to get jealous and angry about other people's success because you're like, you know, I've been working at it longer, or just as hard as them. Why not me? You know, there's no why rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes it happens. It sometimes it's about luck. It's about timing. You know, maybe sometimes, unfortunately it's about somebody, you know, that, you know, someone, maybe a, someone has a connection to someone else and like, hey, I heard you wrote a script about, you know, um, the haunted house. Hey, we're my, my guy, I know a guy is looking for a low budget haunted house picture. You know, let me see it. Yeah. You know, and if you're lucky, maybe they'll take it. If not, they'll say, yeah, it's great, but it's just not what I'm looking for. That you have to, you, you can't just have a thick skin when it comes to this. You have to be practically bulletproof because, you know, it's not even you're going to hear a thousand no's. You're going to probably hear 10,000 no's before you get that one yes. Because think about it, so many people love movies and they want to write movies. And how willing are you to put in the time and effort to to not only become good at it, become really good at it? So so undeniably good about at it, good at it that someone's going to read your stuff and just they can't put it down, or they're just going to say, "I have to see this." You know, if, if if that could happen, you could also get someone to say, "I love this script. I love your writing. There's no way I could get this made, but you know, maybe you'd be open to working on this other thing." that there's no specific path to it. It's kind of like what you have to create your own path and do the best you can with it. And that's a great way. And I want you to say, like, I know I have a lot of authors that listen to my podcast. Mm. Um, so you already know you have the thick skin because the amount of no's that you got and the how they were given, I'm going to tell you, this one's easier. I actually don't mind getting the no's for screenwriting. I'm like, no, but it's no because sometimes, or maybe it's just a no, but no. And when writing, it's just no. Well, that's <laughs> there a no. Why? No, just no. Oh, no, no, no. Y'all got some rough no's. So you're they good. will tell it. They people will say like, oh, it's just not for me or it's not what I'm looking for. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's too similar to something we're already working on. 
and you you can't come back and complain or say like oh well but you know but mine's really good but no just you know take the no you the it's kind of um you can't wait for the phone to ring so to speak you can't wait for that email to come in you know send it move on to the next thing don't even worry about it if you hear back great if not it just wasn't meant to be and that that there's nothing you can do about it once you send it out there it is totally out of your control and you you can bitch and moan all you want about it but you know nothing's going to it's not going to change anything and that's the thing is that i've said this a lot to a lot of writers that i would rather be frustrated and disappointed and keep trying than to stop because i love the writing part too much i love coming up with these stories and i love seeing how people react to my stuff and you know, it's not perfect you know there's always a little tweaking that has to be done but i just love the creative process of coming up with these stories and i always try to think like what's a take on this thing that we all like and enjoy so much what's something different i can do with it so like you know i have a western and i love you know, i love westerns I, you know i grew up i was one of those lucky kids you know i grew up on you know, star wars indiana jones back to the future it's like so what, what's a different approach to the western that i come up with and I'm also a huge fan of old time radio. And I was listening to this one about uh, the heroes were uh, trying to help this this girl because it was the 50s. She, her, her dad had uh, died and they ran a cargo train. I thought, huh, girl in a train. So that developed this story about a female engineer who is like who kicks ass with the best of them. And she had and her best friend is a former slave and he's her mechanic. And they have this train and the, this bad guy steals the train. And they go off to get it back. And it was just, I just, it just, I just wanted to do something with this genre that I love, but what's a different take on it? What's something new? What's unexpected? Because that's a big thing of screenwriting is familiar, but different that, you know, there's all these tropes and cliches of stories, but what's a different take that you could uh, take to, to your story that would make it, you know, have that familiar, but different feel. And so they, like, you know, West Side Story was Romeo and Juliet. They just moved it to the Lower East Side of New York. And uh, Christmas Carol, and they made Scrooged with that. They made it a musical, but it was set at a TV network. So just kind of like, to think of like a story that you want to write. Is it similar to something that's come before? And if it's too similar, what spin can you put on it? And so that's the kind of stuff I like to do with my stuff. So that brings me to pitching. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> because, you know, after every once in a while, you get, you get a screen play and someone actually is interested and you have to pitch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, you mentioned it's like this, but it has a twist. So can you tell us a bit about pitching and what we should know as like fresh newbies that are going into this room to pitch our show? OK, well, first, uh, it's OK to be nervous because you want everybody to like it. And they know and these are people. These are not monsters. These are not corporate machines. They know you're going to be a little nervous. So practice before you do it. But also you have to let, like we were talking about earlier, let your love of the story come through. Don't just go in front of people and like, go like this happens and this, this, then this, and this. Don't like, don't recite your story. Talk about why did you want to write it? What's so exciting about this story? What, what is the uniqueness about this? And let your love of the material come through because that will help you relax because that's not something you can fake. You can, you they will see how authentic you are with what you're talking about. And yeah, again, you have to practice beforehand because don't try, don't do not go in and try to wing it uh, because you will stumble all over your words. You have to practice and just convey your excitement about the story because that can be infectious to other people. And if it's a concept that really grabs them, you know, and they hear this thing like, oh, oh, and they, if you see them lean in like, oh, I, I want to hear more. I want to tell this sounds great. And then, and you can do the whole story. Uh, you can give away how it ends. I'm not it's kind of a mixed bag of reactions about people like who leave it on a cliffhanger. But I think if you're pitching it, you're probably going to want to do the whole story so that they have a better idea of what it's all about. But also no, can focus on the important parts. If you're going to talk about the story, don't don't do the story beats. Talk about the here's why it's exciting. Here's some exciting parts in it, and try to keep it tight, because if you start rambling, you're going to lose their interest. Like they could be fascinated in the beginning, just kind of like, okay, you know, they're just like stumbling over words. They're just they're just rambling. They're just you know doing things by rote right by, by now. That you want to keep it tight. You know, like ninety seconds is is ideal. 
you can talk about that. Or if you want to like throw in a little bit about yourself, that helps too. Uh, and it just, and also practice, practice with people, you know, and people who haven't heard about your story before, see what their reaction is. Are they, are they interested? Did they lean in? Are they kind of like, uh-huh. Yeah. If their eyes start to glaze over, you know, you're doing something wrong. Uh, or if they're really you know, like, the, you can like see there, you've got them, you got the hook and you're trying to reel them in. It's all about confidence and enthusiasm for the material. And uh, just really, you want to share your love and excitement for the material with that other person. And the, the best thing to do is just to really, you know, put your heart into it. Yeah, definitely. Like, I, I think the enthusiasm thing is amazing. I don't get to, I don't pitch. Okay. You know, there's just no reason. In the, I used to. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's too nerve wracking. But I, I love what you said, the enthusiasm. I remember one of the interviews that we had before, they mentioned that, like, if you're a storyteller, bring that. Because, yeah. like, you know how many stories we hear a day? Oh, well, <laughs> like, please they, well, make well, it fun. Oh yeah, because a lot of times, you know, that you that you also have to remember that something you think is a great idea for a story, nobody else might think that. You have to think about it. because a lot of times, excuse me, that the the like if you're t pitching to a manager or a producer, it's not really about you know they can think the story is great, but in the back of their head they're thinking, how can I sell this? Because remember, show business that. So it could be, you know, you could think it's the greatest idea ever, but to them, it's kind of like, you know, there was something like that two years ago and it bombed at the box office. And then if it's you, you can't salvage that. Again, you have to you have to really, you know, try and put your own spin on it so it's unique, but also really interesting that would hold somebody's interest. I love this. Now, completely, I don't do segues here, so we're just jumping, okay? Sure. You're known for Switch. Um, switched. Oh my gosh, that's a short film. Yes. So oh. it's something that got made. I was we we're gonna talk about something that got made. That wow, well, sorry, that I haven't I haven't I, I haven't talked I about that in so it long. To see it be to see it like come onto fruition on a screen. That was really awesome. That was a project I was brought on by the director. And it, honestly, I wasn't really involved with it. Uh, because that's the thing is that's that's part of the writer's uh, the screenwriter's thing is that you write the script and it goes off to the director, and if you're lucky, you'll get invited to set. Uh, depends on how big the project. If it's a short film, unless it's like someone in your town, probably not. I mean, actually, uh, I worked. So a friend of mine connected me with a producer on the East Coast uh, a couple of years ago, and we worked on a feature length uh, script together. And while we were working on that, he came to me like six months in and said, actually, you know, I've got this idea for a short. Would you be, could you like put something together? And so I wrote uh, like an eight minute short film for him and he was on the East Coast. And so he was able to film it over a weekend and uh, put it together. And then when it was done, he sent me a copy of the of the film. And then he and it did well in some of the smaller film festivals. And it, I, that that was the extent of my involvement. So all of these short films that I've been involved with, I'm really, I write it, I send it off, I'm, I get back to my own stuff. So that's oh, pretty much it. So that's, it's just the way that it is. I mean, I don't, yeah, would it be great to be on set? Yeah, but I'm not going to worry about it because uh, I'm more interested. I just want to get my writing done. I mean, I, I've written a couple of shorts that I want to make myself. I'm hoping to actually film one later this year. And I've got a great director and, you know, she's got some projects to work on over the summer. So we'll probably film it in the fall. And so it's it's up to me to put it all together. So that's really about crowdfunding to get uh, to raise the funds for production. And so that's kind of my homework for the summer. That is a whole nother subject about funding. Mm. And one day I'm going to talk about it. Oh, no, I did. I did already with Naomi. Okay. Um, I was like, oh, I'm about to jump down this rabbit hole. I was like, no, no, no. Because there's one more, the next to the last question that I have for you. And I really want to get to this because sure. I spent the rest of the time talking about pasta and pie. And <laughs> so you interview people, you get to interview some amazing people. How do you prepare? How do you not like go, oh my God? Uh, well, it depends. Well, it's like, uh, as I talked about in the beginning, so I did all these interviews with well-known uh, script consultants and a couple of filmmakers and writers that I know. And that was different because that was all uh, via email. 
So I would write, send them the questions and then they would just send their answers back and I would edit them and post them. But uh, since I've been doing uh, my podcast, the Creative Writing Life podcast with me, Paul Zeidman, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We also have a YouTube channel. Go there too. Um, Ching. Uh, so when I, I start just by reaching out uh, to uh, writers and people that I know, I've also had, uh, because we're doing the, I've been doing the podcast for a while, uh, I've had people come to me and say, hey, I got a, a writer who would be a great guest for your show. And so I do some research on the people. Okay, is this something that not only I would find interesting, but I think the listeners and viewers would find interesting as well. And so once we set it all up, I'll just you know, do a little more research. Like I talked to a, to a pair of writers that their publicist reached out to me and said, hey, these guys wrote this. Uh, it's kind of, It's like a a, a take on like a, a military slash fantasy fiction and it's kind of like what if a squad of marines was in lord of the rings and i thought just that's i mean i just thought that sounded hilarious and that's how they wrote it they wrote it as a it's it's got a comedy as, aspect to it and it's you know about this squad of marines and they're trying to make them <laughs> through this uh, dangerous kingdom type of thing and so it's talking to them and did my research on both writers but then I also asked them questions about themselves. You know, how did you get started? How did you guys connect? And they're like, what was the idea for this story? Just because one of the things you probably experienced this as well, when you talk to writers, they love to talk about their work. Maybe not talk about themselves as much, but they love to talk about their work. Because when I talk to a writer, like I'm at a, a, a writer's conference or whatever, I never go in and say, hi, I'm Paul. You've probably heard of my books. Da, da, da. You probably know my blog. I don't make it about me. I make it all about the other person. Like, tell me about you, what you're working on or how did that, you know, what, how did you come up with that idea? That sounds really cool. And that puts them at ease because I want them to be at ease. And so I want it to be very casual. And so I'll just ask them questions about like almost as a fan, but not 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 a gushing fan. So I'll ask them about themselves and about the material and just have fun with it. And that kind of rubs off on them because like these two guys, uh, they, they were talking about the book and everything. And so, you know, I was, of course, I was a D&D &D geek in high school. And so, you know, I said, you know, and I said, okay, I have to ask you the question that is on everybody's mind and it's, uh, everybody's dying to know, is there a gelatinous cube in your story? And they just burst out laughing because they're being... <laughs> Because that's the kind of thing, if, if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, you would hear about. And they and we had like a five minute conversation about why is it a gelatinous cube and its place in, in that kind of story. And it was just fun. And I think that that helped them relax a little more. And it was just fun to talk about because th that made them more comfortable just being a little more uh, relaxed talking about their stuff. So now it comes to my self egotistical question here. Okay? Sure. You know, it's National Poetry Month and this Creative Writer Life podcast. I'm just wondering, have you had a poet on, you know, adorable African-American, <laughs> write screenplays, sold a movie? Wow, we have not had a poet on, uh, but I'm totally open to it because I'm the host and I'm also the producer. Uh, so I can and I'm also the scheduler. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that because it's the Creative Writing Life podcast so there are writers in all kinds of fields like i said we've talked to authors we've talked to screenwriters we've talked to you know a guy who works with writers and helps them uh, publish uh, publish or he helps them with publicity for their material we talked to a guy who's kind of like he's not a motivational speaker but after you talk to him you will be so charged up to want to get to work about your stuff and his his thing is pancakes trust me this this is I, just, I swear to God this is his thing. Uh, For that person out there, Butterfield in <laughs> Chicago. I'll, I'll have to ask him. He's in a, he's in Los Angeles. So and he had a couple of places that he recommended as well. But I'll pass that on to him. Uh, but yeah, you know, I've never talked to a poet because it, that's not a, a, an area I'm as familiar with. But I think uh, having seen some poetry uh, done on tv and also kind of like seeing about what what the i guess what the field is like it's it's something that is definitely worth exploring uh and you know you know my people will be in touch seriously answer this question oh my god no <laughs> <laughs> seriously but i like i thoroughly enjoyed it though. i thoroughly enjoyed your answer okay yeah. well and there's the it's all again I, because i like talking to writers because writers like to talk about writing and, and if I was going to ask to come on your show, I definitely would not be talking about poetry. I turn poetry into screenplays. Okay. 
Yeah. And yeah. you don't meet many people who do that. No, no. Well, that's the thing is, <laughs> see, that's see, that's probably one of the most fascinating aspects about this whole thing is that every writer has their own path of how they got to where they are. And it's great to hear them talk about it because like we were talking about, you know, writers like to talk about themselves and their material. And I love to hear all these different stories because I just think it's great because I am because one of the best things I heard, um, so many years ago, I went to a writing conference in LA and Shane Black was one of the featured speakers. Shane Black, you know, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Lethal Weapon. Uh, and someone asked him, it's like, I forget what the exact question was, but something about, like, about being an aspirational screenwriter. He said, no, let me stop you right there. That you don't aspire to be a screenwriter. If you are writing and you're working on a screenplay, you are a screenwriter. Because aspiring means you just you you're thinking about wanting about writing a screenplay. Actually, just ass in chair writing it. That means you are a screenwriter. Now it's not you're not getting paid for it. It's not being produced, but you are still a screenwriter. So don't call yourself an aspiration an aspiring screenwriter. You are you can call yourself legitimately a screenwriter. And I just thought that was brilliant. And I've I kind of adhered to that ever since that. And so when I hear other writers use that, I will use that quote and they'll say, oh, yeah, I never really thought about it that way. And I think it, it's kind of like it helps uh, it reignite that spark that they have about, you know, wanting to actually sit down and write something. Exactly. And I, w I wanted to say I wanted to go back earlier. You were talking about how you're about getting really good at screenwriting. And it's one of the things that's wonderful, being able to practice it over and over and over again after the form. I remember when I was very discouraged, one of my uh, friends who owns a production company was like, I just says that. Unfortunately, it's a horror production mm -hmm. company, which means that it'll never do anything that I do because I don't do that. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sad. No one's ever taken any time to read that screenplay. She was like, first of all, the people who've read your screenplay, amazing. And then secondly, she recognized you, you're like, you recognize the top 1% are going to make it onto like big movie theaters and big televisions and on studio, on network television. Yeah. The odds are terrible. Oh yeah, the odds but, are against you. But the amount of skill and fun that you have doing it just makes it worth it. And I was like, you're right. And then the next morning I woke up and I sold a movie. So I can't well, do that. There you go. Yeah, because <laughs> because because don't don't go into this thinking that, you know, it's a lottery ticket because it's not that it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and work to again have a, not just a script that's good, but something that someone might be willing to pay for or something, something someone is willing that I'm willing to invest time and money to see that this gets into production. And those are extremely rare. And don't don't do it because you think you're going to get rich at it because you're not. Uh, if you know someone in your community who is like a, wants to make a movie, you know, get in touch with them. Yeah, maybe they'll want to make like a 10 minute short at it. If, if, you trust me, the first draft of whatever you write, it's going to be lousy, but that's, that's, that's a starting point. You can take that and you can kind of work on it and make it better. And again, if you just had a great experience, you know, writing it and working with a filmmaker. And at the end, you still have a 10 minute short that you can show to people. You can, if you're willing to send it into film festivals, see how it does, you know, all the better, because you can also point it and say, I made that. I wrote that. And there's no better feeling than having be able to, be able to show that kind of thing to people because it's a uh, it's all this you know oh I have, I'm working on a screenplay oh have I seen anything you've written well not yet but I'm working on it exactly I want to thank you so much for being here with us today and I wanted like first of all and coming this fall or whenever the movie actually comes out because I know you're shooting it this fall you're going to be able to say that like yeah. like I was really involved it wasn't because a friend of a friend of a friend called and then I got involved at the end no mm -hmm. this is mine <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's because I wrote it like five years ago with the intention I wanted to make it. So I wrote it from a producer standpoint, like make it inexpensive. It's, you know, four characters, two rooms in a house and super easy. And I've had a couple of false starts uh, leading up to it. But I you know think this is the year it's finally going to happen. So I'm just really excited about it. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. Knowing about other people and their their struggles, it's just that is so amazing. Like, I don't know how you're not just like, ah like every time you think about it like because oh. i know all the work i have to do to get there oh <laughs> because oh, there's yeah. a lot there, there, oh, because yeah. you, a lot of people don't realize all the things are involved with trying to get a movie made and let alone a short film so there's yeah, a lot a lot that's a lot i want to thank you again for being here so this time i'm really wrapping it up for reals this time okay <laughs>
That's fine. Can you tell us about where we can find we can find your three books? We can uh, watch the movies that you were involved in and where we can listen to the podcast. Okay, well, I can definitely do the books and the podcast. So the books are, it's called Go Ahead and Ask, uh, about screenwriting and pie. They're all on Amazon. It's all my name, Paul Zeidman. Uh, the blog is MaximumZ.blog. It's all about screenwriting. It's the only MaximumZ blog on the internet, as far as I know. Uh, the podcast, again, the Creative Writing Life podcast, it's on Spotify and on YouTube. And we also have a Twitter account at Podcast CWL. Uh, I'm also on a social, uh, I've got, I'm never going to call it the other thing. I'm still on Twitter at maximum underscore Z. And, uh, my Instagram is at Pez screenwriting P E Z. Those are my initials, just like the candy. Uh, and regarding the stuff I've written, I just, I can't remember because I, th I think there's a, a short, I wrote uh, this one for this producer. It's called the call. And that was on Vimeo the last I saw. I don't know if it still is, but you can dig it up. His name is Tom Balsamides, but maybe my name is in the credits uh, on the on the, the web page. I don't know, but you can dig it up or you can just you know, reach out to me and I'll see if I can get you a link. Oh, nice. Wait, like I'm I'm looking at your IMDb credits right now. Again. Okay, sure. This is like, wait, is it there? Yes, it is. 2022, The Call. Right. Yes. So look, you can find him on IMDb. I am there. So um, I'm going to wrap it up for me over here, which is weird because I'm used to saying us because there's only like a Jade or on either. I don't know. Sometimes she sits on this side. Sometimes she sits on that side. But, you know, so when I say us, I do mean the missing Jade. Anyway, oh, you can find out everything that your ladies are up to at www.andithoughtladies.com. And when you go down to the middle of the page, you can see the charities that we proudly support. We ask that you give them a moment and support them too. That does not mean monetary. It can mean with your, with uh, either hands in the dirt, you know, get out there and do something. Or it could be knowledge, which we had a guest on earlier today. And it was just so much knowledge for nonprofits. I was like, oh my God, please call them immediately. <laughs> either way, we thank you in advance for that support. And remember that wisdom is all around you if you're open to finding it and accepting it. So peace and love, you guys, from Wilnona and the Missing Jade. Oh, yeah. Thanks for listening.